I had a friend who converted to Catholic. He was actually a, a liberal Jew who became Catholic. And one of the proofs that he saw for the Catholic Church was that it seemed like every single per every single group or organization out there was all against the Catholic Church. It's like everybody, mm. whether or not they they disagree with each other, they dis they totally different. Like we have the Muslims on the one hand, we have the communists over here with the feminists. We have the Eastern Orthodox are fighting on, on these similar principles against this very thing, the Roman papacy. Why are they all sort of arrayed together? It's like, what is this? Well, that's the yeah. grand coalition of the status quo. That's this sort of conspiracy of these fallen angels that these people are not coordinating this. It's, it's the, it's the demons, it's the fallen angels who are, who are pulling all these strings and trying to get all these uh, puppets to do their bidding against the Roman Catholic church. Um, so it's really quite remarkable when you look at that, the grand coalition of the status quo, it refers to all these different forces who disagree with each other, but they all agree on one thing. And that is not Rome. Well, on the one hand, we, we avoid uh, harmful or, or erroneous conspiracy theories where we're, we're kind of sort of putting all the blame on one group of people. And, right. the, you know, some of these people are involved. Yes. But uh, the answer is not to ultimately scapegoat these people or that people or whatever, but to fight directly against the fallen angels and there and liberate right. these, these poor souls from being puppets to the, to the demons. So liberating them. And that's, that's the work of the church ultimately. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Catholic culture podcast. In this episode, we're going to be talking about Catholic view of history, broadly speaking, both in terms of some historical scenarios that we're going to discuss, but also sort of Catholic historiography more broadly, what, what should be the Catholic uh, approach to history. And my guest today, I'm really happy to have him on here. Um, he has had me on his podcast, uh, The Meaning of Catholic, a couple of times, his podcast and YouTube channel, and I'm happy to be able to have him uh, back on here in return um, Timothy Flanders, and we'll be talking about his his new book, City of God versus City of Man, The Battles of the Church from Antiquity to the Present. Tim, thank you so much for coming on. Oh, it's always a pleasure to speak with you, Thomas. Thanks a lot for this opportunity. Yeah, we've been talking, uh, discussing various things via, you know, private messaging for, I don't know, a, a, a year or so. Um, on and off, music, uh, culture, different things in the church, agree agreements and disagreements that we have, and always you're always a very gentlemanly, you know, dialogue partner. So I've always always appreciated that. And then, yeah, so I, I came on your podcast. We talked about John Paul II's letter to artists, and then a little bit about some of the pre preliminary essays related to um, John Paul II's, uh, or Wojtyla's, uh, sort of philosophical magnum opus, Person and Act. And actually, I will mention, uh, for the listeners that, um, of course, you will be coming back. And before long, we'll be talking more about Person and Act in, uh, later, I guess later in, uh, in April. So, uh, that'll be great too, because, you know, we, we both spent so long reading that book. It's, it's great to have multiple opportunities to try to unpack it. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and uh, on the subject of dialogue, uh, there's there's a few pages in my book that I credit our dialogue, as I mentioned to you privately. The the section on jazz in the twenties is is very much uh -huh. a direct result of our discussions on that uh, subject. So thank you, and yeah, I look forward to the person and act discussion. Yes, thank you, thank you. That's that's very nice of you. So so yeah, city of God versus city of man: the battles of the church from antiquity to, to the present. So now, obviously, right in the title, you've got a reference to you know Saint Augustine, city of God, um, and you mentioned in at the beginning of this book that you were interested in um, what you call I think you you described them as the two greatest Catholic historians, Saint Augustine and Christopher Dawson, and um, you were interested in synthesizing their approaches in your your big picture view of church history. Now, um, in order not to pretend uh, to my audience to be more well read than I am, I'll admit, uh, not only have I not read Christopher Dawson yet, except for maybe I think one sh really short essay, I have not yet read Augustine's City of God. I'm on schedule to read that, I think at the beginning of next year, 
um, with a, a discussion group that I'm that I'm in. So I'm I'm excited to read that, but I'll have to rely on you, Timothy, to to tell me what is characteristic of these each of these two thinkers' approach to history, and how did you um, approach trying to synthesize their their sort of historiog historiographical <laughs> uh, approach? Yes, absolutely. Well, Saint Augustine's his 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 magna, his own magnum opus, City of God. It's actually called City of God Against the Pagans. That's the full title, hmm. and it's written after the fall of Rome in the West. And this is where many Christians were rather shocked because they they so closely identified the fortunes of Rome with the fortunes of the Church. And Saint Augustine comes along and says, "No, there is a separation between." the city of God, which is the eternal city of God, man, and angels from the beginning of time until the end of time. And there it is intermingled with the city of man, because at the end of time, we, we don't know who's going to be separated in the final judgment. And it is, it is a method that St. Augustine employs. The, the first half of that book is refuting paganism. Uh, so if listeners want to get into that book, you can actually skip the first part because there's so much refutation of Roman paganism. It's very intense because he's just taking them to task. Um, but if you get into the second part, that's the part where he starts to really bring out what is the city of God. Um, but it's, 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 a, it's a, an attempt to infuse the Christendom, the history of Christendom, and take the Hebrew history, the Hebra Hebraic historiography we find in the Old Testament in Genesis, and to infuse that into church history so that his contemporaries can look at the fall of Rome and understand that God is still providential, providentially in, in control of history. And I think that that's the, the main point, really, of that whole work is that God is the main subject of history. God is the one moving all of these different parts. God is in control, even if Rome falls. And that's one of the biggest pieces of historiography that we've lost as, as Christians because we've, we've taken on so many sort of materialistic forms of history. So even if you read a modern church history book, you'll, you'll get, uh, you know, this king arose and this pope arose and this thing happened and this thing happened. But there's no sort of interpretation that St. Augustine brings, which is God is present providentially moving these different pieces and parts in his own plan. This is what we get in the book of the Apocalypse, in the book of Revelation. It's this cosmic vision of God's history, and that God is the Lord of history. So that's St. Augustine, but he's writing in the 400s, and he sort of continues on this Hebraic historiography through the apocalypse, through the fall of Rome, through this whole cosmic history, looking forward to the end of time. And Christopher Dawson comes along and he begins to make a transition back to this Augustinian view of history. In his time, he's writing in the 20th century, and he sort of invents this new genre known as meta-history. And that's sort of the history of all these different cultures taken in the broadest possible sense. And he argues that the real uh, because history, as I said, is very materialistic in the sense that people are just concerned with, okay, here's an economic movement that happened, or here's a scientific movement that happened, and this and that, and the other thing, and all these different causes and effects. But Ga Dawson says the actual, the moving of history is being moved by religious causes. And you can even think of it in a, in a purely naturalistic sense and just think about the cultists, the cultic rites of a culture, and how those are the, that's the momentum of a culture, is this cultic rite, which gets passed down from generation to generation in every different culture. And we see, and he, he writes the, this brilliant history of Christendom, uh, uh, talking about the formation of Christendom, the formation of Europe, the idea of Europe, and how these things are being moved by the culture, the cultists, which then moves everything else that's going on in economics, politics, ecclesiastical, this, that, and everything else is being moved by this motion of history that God is moving through the cultists. So synthesizing the two is taking Dawson's meta-historical work, 
with culture and um, framing history in this sense of cultural, uh, the this centrifugal force of culture in history and infusing it with the further uh, framework of St. Augustine, which is attempting to see the providence of God in all things. And so what my book is, is attempting to do is it's attempting to frame our current controversies that we deal with every day as Catholics it's trying to frame it in in a sense that God is in control of these historical things. Here's what we've seen before. Here are different hypotheses that one can have, drawing on the saints and how the saints view these different historical uh, circumstances. And then how could how is what are some possible ways that we can look at our current state of affairs in the in modernity? What what how do we see God working here and now? Where might God be leading us uh, out of these different crises in the church and society? So. It's an attempt to take St. Augustine and um, take Dawson's work and try to summarize it and boil it down into this one volume history that I've written um, to try to give Catholics this context uh, to try to help them um, strengthen their own faith, to face our current situation uh, with confidence in God's providence. Um, so that's the attempt, that's the attempt that, uh, is made in the book. And um, now really quick, if I want to eventually read some Dawson, where would be a good place to start? Um, I think uh, an easy place to start here. Let me just pull something here. <clears throat> Probably one of the easiest ways to start is the formation of Christendom. Um, that's just a, a basic break breakdown of, of why, why is Christendom so unique? How did it bring together these different cultures? Um, it, it's what is Christendom? Um, I think that that's very, very good. Um, here's another very interesting book he wrote called The Judgment of the Nations. This was a book that he wrote during World War II. Mm. And so he was, he was making a, a providential claim about what is World War II? And he said, it's the judgment of the nations. God is judging the nations. And he right. and he takes World War II and then he reflects on Christendom. And, and so he looks at it a little bit more pragmatically. What has caused this? What has caused the breakdown of Christendom? What has led to this awful world war? How do we then uh, rebuild it? So then he starts to talk about practical steps as well. Uh, and that's a little bit shorter book too, but those are two recommendations I would have for Dawson. Yeah. Okay. So as you were talking about Augustine um, infusing this Hebrew approach to history as seen in the Old Testament into a look at Christendom, uh, one thing that occurred to me is, uh, and your your book very much does this, is, I mean, if you look at the Old Testament, and as I, as I get older, I find myself more and more in love with the Old Testament – um, speaking of which, I really enjoyed your uh, discussion of the Pentateuch with Gideon Lazar on the, the Meaning of Catholic channel. Um, oh, great. But, yeah. uh, but um, <clears throat> anyway, um, what, one thing that stands out is obviously with regard to God's people, uh, the things that happened to them are very much connected to uh, their fidelity or infidelity to God. Um, and uh, I don't think that this is a really fashionable way of looking at history, even among Catholics these days. Um, but obviously, a big part of Augustine, it sounds like, based on this Judgment of the Nations book, you were just talking about that Dawson had really has um, internalized this way of thinking as well. And it's very much a part of your book. So, you know the idea that obviously it's 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 very easy to oversimplify cause and effect in history, even on a on the spiritual plane. But um, yeah, how do you, how do you go about um, looking at um, sort of yeah the judgment of the nations more broadly in history and the 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 effects of spiritual um, spiritual matters on say you know god allowing a country to be conquered by, by its enemies or things like that without being sort of facile and oversimplified and um how do you how do you kind of try to look at things in a really spiritual spiritual and providential light without being kind of um yeah i guess facile is the, the word i would use yeah and i mean these are just um these are hypotheses really um but it's really drawing on the saints so for example um, 
when we look at the responses to the rise of Islam, when it invades mm -hmm. most of Eastern Christendom, that all of the Middle East used to be Christian, how do the saints understand that? And they see this thing happening. How do they understand that? Well, I, I quote in my book various saints from various sides, even a Jewish source, that all say, well, this is the wrath of God that's come upon us for our sins. So we need to do penance. And Christopher Dawson also says the same thing. Um, but it, but these are this is how do you do that? Well, you look at the way, how does God deal with His people in the Old Testament and right. in the Apocalypse because it's it's really you know it's it's in the Apocalypse it says it has the same thing and the Apocalypse really sort of has this it shows us the city of God, the New Jerusalem coming down from heaven, and then the the city of man, the the Babylon, the the various symbolic uh, references which can be taken to mean literally the earthly city of Jerusalem, which was destroyed by the wrath of God, as Jesus himself says, right. or it can also mean every other city that exalts itself against God could also go on to be uh, referred to Rome. Um, I think of, I when you said that, Thomas, I, I first thought of this, this great quote that I found uh, right before the Protestant revolt. And this is from the, Catholic Encyclopedia entry on Pope Leo X during the fifth ecumen or the sorry the Lateran V, fifteen seventeen. So this is in the springtime of fifteen seventeen, right before in the fall was when Martin Luther nailed his theses, and it's re this really interesting scene where it says that at the end of this ecumenical council, this highly cultured layman G. F. Francesco Picadello Birandolo, he delivers this speech and he says that. Um, he concluded with a warning that if the Pope left such offenses longer unpunished and refused to apply healing remedies, it was to be feared that God himself would cut off the rotten limbs and destroy them with fire and sword. So he's warning of the wrath of God to come if they don't correct the more the problems in the church at the time. And mm -hmm. it's interesting how uh, obviously that happens. The Catholic Encyclopedia actually says uh, his prophecy went unheeded and then Martin Luther happened. And what's interesting, Rome still does not act even after all this starts, stuff starts happening. It's only after Rome is actually sacked and all, all kinds of atrocities happen in the city of Rome. You have Lutheran iconoclasts doing all sorts of nasty things in the city of Rome. And then the Roman Curia says, it is the wrath of God. We have to act. And that's where the Council of Trent comes in. So we have this. It, 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 it's sort of, on the one hand, we don't want to be too dogmatic about this and say, well, like, this is dogmatically, we should clearly understand that this is the wrath of God or this message telling us this or whatever. On right. the other hand, it's kind of like simple, pious Catholics just kind of understand this. It's like, well, right. wrath of, you know, World War II happened, therefore the wrath of God. Like, we have Fatima, we have Fatima which warns of this greater wrath to come which is this sort of universal public, you know, private revelation, but it's also public revelation yes, in, in yes. that sense. And so it's, it's in a sense, it's like every sort of common layman should be able to just kind of understand that. Like we have a world war, clear that the wrath of God is come upon us. Let's do penance. So that's kind of, I, I think it's, it's, it, we shouldn't be too dogmatic about it, but at the same time, I think this is something that we can all, like the census fidelium can should be able to grasp this right yeah no it's very interesting it's something i th find myself thinking about a lot tim with the present situation in the church is just how this kind of old testament mindset is so um there's there's it's so matched and continued by all of the like for lack of a better word, like the old school saints from, you know, the earliest centuries of the church through, you know, John Henry Newman and even later. Um, and um, uh, yeah, there, there's just this ancient mindset that I think a lot of Catholics now are really uncomfortable, even like uh, otherwise Orthodox Catholics are really un maybe uncomfortable thinking, uh, thinking about things in these terms because it maybe seems like, you know, I don't know, fundamentalist or whatever word they might might use. Um, okay, so I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the the big themes uh, that you that recur throughout your history. Um, it's a very it's a very capacious history because it covers not just the Western 
um, Catholic Church, but also um, all these other Eastern churches uh, as well. And there's a big um, emphasis on um, the plurality of peoples and, um, you know, sort of lowercase c churches within the Catholic Church and within Christendom over the millennia. Um, so why was it so important to you to be um, – to really take the time to, you know, check in, say, at different points with what's happening with the church, uh, you know, in in Armenia or, you know, uh, the, the Coptic uh, people even who are, you know, no longer really in union you, you with Rome but still Christian peoples um, – uh, you know, rather than just focusing on the Western church, as many people would do when writing this sort of book. Yeah, and this is just Augustine and Dawson again. Uh, Augustine talks about how the, the city of God is this universal thing, this universal polity, which does not scruple about individual cultural customs, and yet unites them all into one big culture. It's a culture of cultures. And this is what Dawson has done so well in his books. He has, he has, uh, his original plan was to write this massive meta history of all, every culture. <laughs> and uh, he does cover a ton of different cultures. Like I cited his book, a, a lesser known book about the uh, missions to the Orient that were happening as the Mongol invasion was happening. Um, one of the unique things about my book is that I include, um, as much of the history of the Syriac Christians as possible, the, the Far East Christians who go all the way to Japan, which is almost completely ignored by almost every history you'll read, unfortunately. Um, <clears throat> but why is that is so important? It's because, one, I think when you read the Holy Scriptures and you read, you know, the book of Genesis to Apocalypse, Genesis talks about all these different nations who are all just brothers and families and sons of, of this person and that person, uh, the sons of Edom, the sons of Ammon, the sons of Moab. Um, and then in the apocalypse, it talks about every tribe, every tongue, all worshiping. And what's so remarkable about the Catholic faith, which makes it unique, is that it does create these a, a Christendom of Christendoms. And the way that the Catholic culture is able to infuse the divine, the power of divine grace communicated through the, the rite of mass, even in, in its various forms, in every single culture, in, in a sense, Christ himself is able to incarnate himself, his body, in a new culture, in a new land, speaking a new language, in every age. And that's so remarkable, and it's so unique. Um, only the Catholic Church can do this, which is fully the scriptural vision from the Holy Scripture of this, this Christendom of Christendoms. Um, but personally, part of it was also my own journey out of Protestantism and out of Eastern Orthodoxy, because ultimately those two also are culturally insular, culturally myopic. Um, they cannot fully achieve this vision of, of Christendom. It is this, it's really this remarkable vision of every tribe and tongue. Um, it's, it's the 12 tribes of Israel. The, the salvation is from the Jews, but then they go, he says, our Lord says that to the Samaritan woman, and he reunites the 12 tribes of Israel and all, all tribes and tongues. And, um, you know, Noah prophesies that Japheth and Shem will share the same tent. Um, and then, the, then there's the whole curse of curse of Ham ideology, which is another t huge factor in the history, which is very much ignored or avoided. Um, but that's also integrated into this same vision in Genesis and through through the whole Scripture. So, mm. um, to me, it's it's really shows the glory of Christendom is, is the, its ability to. Uh, how divine grace transforms peoples and nations and really creates um, these, this Christendom of Christendoms. Yeah, that's great. So speaking of plurality within unity, there's another kind of plurality that you look at in the book, and it's very much connected with your, I think, your hopes for what this book will help help to do in, in today's church, which is your discussion of these different parties within Orthodox um 
Catholicism, which uh, the, you talk about sort of the, the strict and the moderate and how there are kind of there are kind of saints of of both stripes, you know, throughout the church's history um, and that, you know, they they need there needs to be this fruitful tension, but also allegiance between the two in whatever it is, interpreting uh, theology or discipline or prudential matters, whatever it might be. Um, but can you can you explain what you mean by the strict and moderate? Maybe give some examples and how that might um, how that might connect to our, our own time. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's um, and that that's one of the main hypotheses of the book, which directly bears upon our current controversies. Um, well, the idea from Dawson is that um, Christendom itself is uh, has a body and a soul. Its body is the Greco-Roman culture, and its soul is the Hebrew culture. So there's it sort of vivifies this natural greatness of the Greco-Roman civilization, but. Between the Greco and the Roman, there is also this tension. The Greco is seeking for some new things, as St. Luke says in the book of Acts, the, the Grecians are see seeking some new thing. And the Romans are very strict, though. They're extremely conservative. They're always trying to just keep order, keep everything conservatively the same as it was before, and preserve everything the same. And so that's the strictness. So there's this strictness in Christendom. We always want to preserve exactly the same thing, pass it down from our forefathers, but then there's also this this Greco mind as well. It's it's really and, and that's really what and God inspired the um you know the New Testament is written in Greek because uh, anarchy in logos you have to say that in Greek you have to say in the beginning was the logos in order to really get at the metaphysical reality of of this great divine mystery, um and that's great some great new thing that one can only bring about through this Greco mindset. So that's the sort of this moderate party. The moderate party wants to seek out some new thing, but in order to preserve what was handed on before. So, um, so we have this dynamic tension between these two parties of Christendom, which are both seeking the same thing. They're both seeking Christ the King in their given situation, but they're doing it in different ways. So in every controversy, but also in just the, the natural development of Christendom penetrating cultures with divine grace, we need to have a balance between these two things. Uh, you, first of all, you can see that in the way that Christian culture transforms the all the cultures passed on among the sons of Adam, uh, is that the, the culture that is baptized so that very lot there's a Roman instinct, there's a strict instinct in the culture to preserve things that were passed down in that culture before the gospel came. For example, the language, that's the most conspicuous thing that has continued to pass down. Um, various customs, cuisine, um, accidental features of the of the culture. But then there is this Greek notion of infusing it with some new thing, embracing some new thing, embracing this gospel which really restores what was in the beginning. Um, but we begin to see a more definite sort of ecclesiastical tension, especially during what I, what I term the four great Greco-Roman renewals, uh, what I, which I term as these four different periods of great renewal and sort of progress in the true, in the true sense of the word progress in terms of progression, meaning subordinating the temporal sphere to Christ the King, subordinating the laws to Christ the King, subordinating the philosophy to Christ the King, all things renewed in Christ. So that's what I mean by mm. progress. And that's the, these Greco-Roman renewals. So in these four different periods, and the fourth of which we are in today, we're currently in this period, we see these different parties arise who have to find out a working tension between them so that they can overcome the obstacles to Christ the King in their the period of their uh, their souls and their societies. Um, the conspicuous example that I bring out in the first Greco-Roman renewal is the parties, the Nicene parties. So the first of all, the Nicene Creed that we ref we uh, profess at the Holy Sacrifice is a Greco moderate idea because it is innovating. It is using a new word, consubstantialum patre, homoousios. Uh, it's a new term, a new word, innovated in order to preserve the truth the same as it was mm. before. So it's it's both and. It's as Saint Augustine said, 
late have I loved the beauty ever ancient, ever new. And that's this sort of tension between the old and the new coming right. together. You have to add something new to preserve what came before. So that those are the, the party of Athanasius is this moderate Greco party who is wanting to change something new to preserve what came before. But then there's also this sort of ortho, so the, the so-called Orthodox semi-Aryans, which I think is a bad pejorative, but uh, people like St. Basil the Great in his earlier days were, they were opposed to the Nicene definition because of this innovation. They wanted to preserve what came before. And what Athanasius does is he, he reconciles these two parties in order to overcome the, the threat of Arianism and all the different forms of Arianism is, is bringing together these two parties so that we cannot interpret on the one hand, we cannot interpret the Nicene definition in a, uh, in a brand new way, because we can't interpret that in a way that makes it um, of a different substance with what came before. Uh, but we also can't reject it totally because we need to add this new terminology in order to preserve it. So this is the type of thing that uh, goes on. A, a, a more, another conspicuous example is the Council of Trent and how the Council of Trent really, from Florence all the way through Trent, Trent is reconciling uh, the scholasticism of the of, of St. Thomas and Bonaventure, which is the strict party that, that wants to keep everything the same, with this new movement called humanism. Renaissance humanism wants to use all these texts, want to, wants to resource a bunch of Itali uh, the uh, Latin and, and Greek texts, uh, spreading the knowledge of Greek, printing the Greek New Testament, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And Trent reconciles these two parties and creates a new thing called Baroque civilization which is this synthesis between the new Renaissance humanism, uh, you know, Palestrina, you know, if your, your listeners like Palestrina, Palestrina is a Renaissance polyphony. That's something that's created new out of this new period. And so the church does not reject that new thing as long as it is in conformity with what came before. So that's the example of, that would be actually the third Greco-Roman revolution <laughs> or renewal. And the fourth one is what we're in today. And I, I essentially, boil it down to sort of Vatican one is very much a Roman strict council, whereas Vatican two is very much a Greek moderate council, emphasizing some new thing. And the answer to our woes is to synthesize these two things. There needs to be a synthesis and a balance between the pre Vatican two magisterium, the PN magisterium from 1773, all the way to 1958, that whole period, which is very critical of modernity with this conciliatory spirit of modernity. Uh, there needs to be a balance and a synthesis between these two, because that's that's the whole ecclesiastical tension that we're dealing yeah. with. Is the tension? I, I totally agree, and right. and you know, an observation I make very often is that again, going back to to Newman, a, a, such a great example of a saint who and a preacher who um, is so strikingly modern, and so he can really speak to us as modern people. He's very psychological, you know. Uh, in, in, in that way. Um, and yet his mindset is very much this ancient, he's, he's steeped in the church fathers, you know, um, and, uh, his, his spiritual approach is the, the ancient one. And, um, you know, I, I've made this, this comment before, and it may sound a little harsh, but even m much of the best Orthodox preaching that I hear today, um, I, I feel like, well, I can put it this way. There's, I feel like there's more in common with the preaching of John Henry Newman and the preaching of a, you know, a second century church father, um, than in, in its spirit in some way, um, than there is between either of those and even much of the best, most edifying Orthodox preaching that I'll hear in a, in a good parish today. It's just striking. And I don't mean to say that they're the, you know, modern, these, these, you know, priests are heterodox or anything like that, but it's just, there's something about, yeah, the willingness to talk about the wrath of God or, you know, uh, to really convict the conscience in some way, or, and I'm not even talking about focusing on negative, uh, negative things necessarily, but on the supernatural rather than the psychological, for instance, you know? Um, I'm sure you know what I'm talking, uh, what I'm talking about. And, and, and it's not that, you know, there aren't plenty of good preachers today, but there is something from, and, and it, and it's the same with you, as you say, the, the pion, you know, magisterium. Um, I, I so much, I love, 
uh, I love, you know, Casty Kanubi, you know, by Pius the 11th. And, um, and, uh, there's so much great stuff by, um, Wojtyla, John Paul II on marriage. And, um, but there's things that aren't emphasized, right? We've talked about this, you know, and so uh, without even needing to get into the specifics, it's just in a general way, I do really feel like right now we're in this mindset where it's like almost anything that was promulgated by a pope before Vatican II, if it hasn't been re-promulgated since then, it's treated as it's as though it's irrelevant, you know? And I, I, I really think that rather than just constantly debating over the meaning of Vatican II, we need to synthesize with – yeah, Leo the Thirteenth, and not not just the stuff about the economy from Leo the Thirteenth. I'm talking about you know immortality day, you know the relationship between the church and the state, stuff like that, and Pius the Eleventh, um, Pius the Tenth. I think Pius the Twelfth um, is probably a good example of um, uniting the strict and the moderate too, because he seems. I haven't read a lot of him, but he seems to have been very sensitive to modern conditions. For example, in his uh, catechesis on marriage, um, but also very much, very solidly grounded in the traditional teaching and the traditional prudence and wisdom on those. I, I mention him because um, one of our uh, people at Catholic Culture has has for the past several months been. Uh, scanning and getting ready to upload his addresses, uh, Pius XII's addresses to newlyweds. Um, so we can put them on our oh, site wow. and they'll be freely the whole collection that came out. I want to say awesome. in the seventies, it's, it's been, it's been, uh, out of print for a long time and then it was republished. It's, it's public domain now and it's, it's only available in, I think, like a print copy from that, that, uh, big SSPX, uh, bookstore and, and, Angelus, maybe I can, yeah. Angelus, yeah. Um, and so uh, I, I emailed them and asked, "Is this um, is this public domain?" And they were like, "Yeah." And so I'm like, "Okay, man, I'm gonna put the, put this online because I think I think it's great. I haven't read the whole thing, but you, you just read excerpts and um, like his predecessor, Pius XI, when he's talking about some of the more difficult things about you know hierarchy and marriage, for instance. He's so sensitive and so pastoral, and yet it's so solidly grounded um, in. Uh, in the tradition. Anyway, not to go off on a whole tangent, but the, you know, those are just some examples yeah. of how um, we don't need to, you know, for example, on the topic of uh, mutual submission, John Paul II is very associated with this phrase in his teaching on marriage. There's totally a way of reading that in conformity with the tradition. Um, and I think that we have to be willing to do the work to do, to do that, you know, from both sides of the equation, not to say, well, it changed and that's good, and it, or it changed and that's bad. But to really read it in conformity with the tradition, and um, there's no reason we can't. I think there's no reason why we can't have both, you know. Oh yeah, and, that, and that's that's um, one of my my favorite chapters of my book is about uh, the. It's called the mustard seed against uh, armies, because Christ Himself founds the church in these domestic churches. And he transforms the uh, pagan masculinity and even the Jewish masculinity, as well as the femininity. And central to this is Marian devotion. Um, and, and speaking of Newman, um, there's his his Discourse 17, The Glories of Mary for the Sake of Her Son, where he provides this Mariological interpretation of history, is 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 a central uh, piece that I use in my text to try to interpret these different things. Um, and what, what's, what's interesting to me is that when we look at, for example, the history of feminism, I think that we can understand that there was first a, a, a destruction of Marian devotion by the Protestants, mm. which led to a, a restoration of a pagan view of woman where, woman is objectified for either for lust or just objectified for children right. so that a woman is no more than just a, a baby machine which is not a quote unquote like trad thing. catholic view right right so that and that's and then in the in the catholic side we have these the influence of things like jansenism right. which are very this very strict and rigorous interpretation of these things and so what we notice is that there is this, and you know, we have, we have, um, we have like in my state of Michigan, we have, um, 
Magdalene Laframboise, who was a Catholic uh, French Métis woman who was a widow and she took over her husband's fur trading business. And so feminists today were like, oh, like, oh, she's this, you know, woman businessman. But really, that's just Catholic culture. Like, you don't, we don't disinherit women. <laughs> like, we don't say like women can't inherit right. property. That's like a Puritan right. thing. So we have this sort of subjugation of woman as a direct result of destroying the cultus mm. of Mary. Um, but then we have this reaction to that, which is feminism, which is a reaction to this subjugation of women. So it's an overreaction on the other side where women are seeking power and they're seeking their dignity in power. Um, so they're continuing the same Protestant mindset of, of power is dignity. So therefore, if I don't have power, I don't have dignity. And, um, and so we see in these different things, that the direct result of the, the cultists um, and how, um, it, it, as you men just mentioned, John Paul II, I, I think that John Paul II especially can be understood in the particular regimes that he was dealing with, namely National Socialism and Soviet Communism, which both objectified yeah. women as baby yeah. factories. Um, and so we can understand his hesitancy to um, take it, take it the tack that he did or the, the way, reason that he did that. Um, so I think that what we see is, 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 a, is a, what we need is this proper balanced Christendom, which really gives us, which flows from the divine grace communicated through the cultists and is transformed from the very beginning. Uh, from this pagan Rome. That's why I go into a lot of details about uh, what were the, what was the family like in ancient Rome? What was the father yeah. like? What was the mother like? How do they act? What do the children do? And then we look at what we have now and how Christ transformed these things. And what we see today with sort of this neo-pagan view in, in many different ways. But I think that like you just pointed out, there needs to be this deeper and more penetrating analysis of things like feminism because um, it's deeper than just merely, oh, feminism is just this evil thing that happened in uh, you know, the 19th century or second wave feminism or whatnot. Right. It's actually has a history back. Yes. So that's part of this history is try, trying to provide a very concise history, but also providing the nuance that makes it so that people cannot ideologize history because mm. i think that that's something that really has struck us a lot too in our modern controversies is that like the on the trad side they they tend to oversimplify the pre-vatican II church like oh you know pre-vatican church was this and this and this and they don't they don't realize there's certain precedent like you said like Pius the 12th i would say leo the 13th in way many ways too has this sort of moderate view towards modernity as well. This sort of uh, presages some of the Vatican II efforts. Um, and then on the other hand, there's sort of this ideologizing of history. Uh, you know, the Vatican II is, you know, or, or the, the pontificate of John Paul II, which a Pope that I praise in the book, but obviously he had blind spots and weaknesses and things that he missed or whatever. And not every Pope can do everything either. So. Right. And, yeah. Um, Another example of the strict and moderate I wanted to touch on at least briefly is another one that's very relevant to our current situation is that the sort of theological controversies and that maybe happened in the early 20th century going on through and uh, in the aftermath of Vatican II. And um, one thing that I really noticed is your, your comment that instead of trying to seek common ground with each other, the strict and moderate parties of the Orthodox uh, Catholics um, would instead – they instead began to ally with the strict secular or the moderate secular, if that makes sense. So they would ally with people who were on their side in a sort of um, maybe political or broadly speaking ideological sense without being actually Orthodox Catholics and they – that whenever the strict and the moderate are – things start to break down whenever the strict and moderate are preferring to ally with their secular counterparts rather than with each other within Christian unity. So can you talk about not, – not get into all the theological details yeah. of the different debates or anything, but just talk about some examples of how that's happened from maybe the early 20th century, the, the Thomas, the traditional Thomas, the Nouvelle Theology, and, the, and then the parties at Vatican II and afterwards. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it starts with the the basic theological truth that all true cultural and spiritual transformation comes from divine grace through the cultist that as instituted by Christ. And so there can't really be any common ground with non-Catholics that sort of supersedes one's own common ground with fellow Catholics, because mm. that is the that's the truth where we need to deal with every situation with our fellow Catholics, because God is working through the church to resolve these things. So this this first starts to be a, a big issue. Um, I mean, it's already in the French Revolution. You have half right. of the clergy sign on to the revolution. Uh, Pius VII reconciles them back, but does not require them to renounce what they had vowed. Um, we have the counter-revolutionary movements against the liberal rev revolutionaries who are monarchists, so they're defending all these monarchies. But a lot of these monarchies, the reason that they're revolting against these monarchies is because the monarchies are corrupt. And they're just, you know, the the unfortunately, I mean, the Fr as bad as the French Revolution was, the French kings were tyrants. And so they were revolting against tyranny and overreacting in, in all of these uh, liberal ways and evil ways. But the monarchy, the Catholic monarchists find common ground with the secular monarchists. And the secular monarchists don't really care about the Christian faith. They're just going through the motions to preserve their own power and preserve tradition and also that sort of thing. Um, and so this is what makes communism susceptible to the masses because the communists come along and say, oh, well, all you poor people, see, the church doesn't care about you. Uh, clearly, they're just allying with all the power. Right. And um, what happens at Vatican I is that there's sort of these three parties. Uh, there's the heretical party, which totally rejects papal infallibility per se. But then there's this moderate party, like St. John Henry Newman, who says, yes, I believe in papal infallibility, but we shouldn't exaggerate that. And then there's the ultramontanists or the neo ultramontanists or the hyper uber ultramontanist party who wants to exalt and, and they're allied with all the monarchists. So there's monarchy in the world and monarchy in the church. And so, so, so they actually start to ostracize this moderate party. Who's this Orthodox party? Like St. John Henry Newman calls them the tyrant majority of Vatican one. And so after Vatican I is this sort of this period of um, there, there's a lot of good things after Vatican I. There is there is a Thomistic revival. There's lots of good things that are happening, conversions, etc. But at the same time, there's also um, the Umberto Benigni, who headed up the Soledatium Pianum uh, under Pius X and after him under Benedict the Fifteenth. Uh, apparently he was also persecuting everybody who was not a, a monarchist like him as a modernist. Hmm. And so he was wading into these, these, con these more of temporal authority controversies and imposing his political views on others. So this is what creates a, a situation w which comes to a head in the 1940s and 50s with the Nouvelle Theologie, AKA Ressourcement, whatever you want to call it. Some of those people don't like that term, but just for the sake of history, um, there is a debate that happens between those guys like Henri de Lubac, people have heard of him in France with other French Dominicans as well as um, Roman Dominicans. And there's this um, tension that is, is created but never resolved. And we see ultimately the fruit of this sort of animosity that has been, has been building since the 19th century but had become acute since the First Vatican Council and Pius X and, and Umberto Bernini, Benigni, not Bonini, Benigni, um, we have this backlash at Vatican II and after. We have a backlash against that excessiveness. And this is what helps explain what happened to Vatican II because we have this, al the, the, the big issue was that before Vatican II, we had the, the Orthodox Catholic monarchists whether ultramontanists or otherwise, allying with these secular forces. But then we have at Vatican II, we have the opposite thing happening. We have the ressourcement type thinkers who are Orthodox, like Ratzger or Wojtyla, who are more or less allies or at least 
they're willing to give a pass or not very strongly, harshly rebuke people like Hans Kuhn until a little bit later. He does get rebuked a little bit. But if you compare what, you know, Hans Kuhn versus the treatment of Archbishop Lefebvre, um, I think that it is reasonable to argue that Lefebvre, you know, he got he got a he got his hand slapped pretty hard, whereas Hans Kuhn got a little bit, you know, Hans Kuhn was definitely a heretic. He, 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 he denied the infallibility of the Pope. He denied dogmas, you know, definitely a heretical force here. And he's teaching at a Catholic university for, for decades. <clears throat> and so there appears to be this animosity. And we, I mean, we can, if we even set aside Lefebvre and we just talk about like the Latin mass, for example, um, you know, why was there such uh, such a resistance to allow those forces at Vatican II? Um, you had the conservative traditionalist bishops who felt isolated because mm. they were, they seemed to be trying to defend what came before against the united forces of the European alliance of the resource among sort of the good guys, but also the bad guys. And they were kind of allied at Vatican II. And they were allied after, and that only after Vatican II, they, they break up into Concilium Journal and mm. Communio Journal. Um, but then we have this civil war between tho those parties that continues to this day. Um, because it's in the <clears throat> implementation of Vatican II that people like de Lubac or Maritain or, um, you know, whoever are, are starting to see some of the really bad things that are happening and uh, speak out about, uh, against it, in some cases quite strongly. Yes, and Henri de Lubac says in 1967 that they are trying to create a new church other than the Church of Christ in the name of ecumenism, mm -hmm. for example. So that's a pretty good big state. That's a strong statement, of course. <laughs> but I think that the answer should have been, hey, you know, those 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 rigid trad bishops that we we mocked at Vatican II. Why don't we join up with them? And right. then we can together we can we can fight this heretical depravity that has been vomiting forth in the church ever since all this started happening. Right. Um, but I think that we had there is so much bad blood and animosity that these parties felt like they had to go it alone. And I think it's it's only now in in the past decade or so that we've really seen a lot more of those two parties come together a lot more because they see. Um, efforts that are not only against the Latin mass, but we have efforts against the, um, the legacy of John Paul II, for example, at the same right. time, right, you know, right, things right. like that. And so we have, whoa, whoa, wait, so what's going on here? This is, this is, we all agree on, on these basic things. Yeah. Something's happening. Something's wrong. We all need to work together to work against it. Right. Um, well, thank you for that. Uh, what is the grand coalition of the status quo? <laughs> well, the, that is a phrase from John C. Rao in his book, Black Legends. And this is an attempt to provide a spiritual explanation to the various forces that array against the church from the city of man. Um, throughout history, various Catholics have posited various conspiracy theories, which are more or less true depending on what's going on. So they say, oh, well, the Masons are together and they're working together or the communists are together. And um, I think that what's really clear, though, I think when you think about it, when you read the book of the apocalypse, you see that the it's really the fallen angels and the demons are the conspiracy is that they are pulling the strings in all these different places. And all of these different actors are just puppets. Um, I had a friend who converted to Catholic. He was actually a, a liberal Jew who became Catholic. And one of the proofs that he saw for the Catholic Church was that it seemed like every single per every single group or organization out there was all against the Catholic Church. It's like everybody, mm -hmm. whether or not they, they disagree with each other, they disagree, they totally different. Like we have the Muslims on the one hand, we have the communists over here with the feminists. We have the Eastern Orthodox are fighting on, on these similar principles against this very thing, the Roman papacy. Why are they all sort of arrayed together? It's like, what is this? Well, that's the yeah. grand coalition of the status quo. That's this sort of conspiracy of these fallen angels. They're, these people are not coordinating this. It's, it's, the, it's the demons, it's the fallen angels who are, who are pulling all these strings and trying to get all these 
uh, puppets to do their bidding against the Roman Catholic Church. Um, so it's really quite remarkable when you look at that. The Grand Coalition of the Status Quo, it refers to all these different forces who disagree with each other, but they all agree on one thing, and that is not Rome. Uh, an example of this is during the Anglican Re Reformation, <coughs> excuse me, the Anglican Protestant Revolt was when Parliament and the King, who both disagreed with each other, they both agreed on one thing, not Rome. So they're not actually agreeing a, on a positive principle of it's this, they're just agreeing on it's not this. And that, you know, that you could even talk about the entire, all the different Protestant groups. There are, there's 48,000 sects now, and they all disagree with each other, but they all agree on not Rome. Well, that is an example of this grand coalition. The um, reason it's the status quo is because it's really fallen human nature resisting transformation of all things in Christ, which can only come about through the Roman Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Mass, the divine grace communicated to the world through the church. And so it is a desire to maintain that status quo. Another example that to me was very uh, enlightening in my research in this book was the the pagan concept of the Pontifex Maximus, that the, the Roman emperor is the high priest of the Roman religion. And this is what helps inform the tensions between East and West and ultimately the, the various Greek schisms and the Eastern Orthodox schism is that the emperor understood himself as the Pontifex Maximus, is that he was sort of a bishop of bishops. And this is trying to maintain the status quo. It's trying to maintain this pagan understanding and resisting transformation of all things in Christ. And so that's why we see, and Newman says it, I have quotations from Newman that he also sees that he sees how all the heretics work together, even though they disagree with each other. It doesn't make sense. It, the only way that makes sense is if we have this spiritual understanding, because we see it in the book of the apocalypse. We see the, the land beast and the sea beast working together and these various forces working together and arrayed against uh, why do the nations conspire and the, and the peoples took counsel together against the Lord and his Christ. We see it at, at, in, in the time of Christ. We have these various Jewish sects, which all disagree with each other. We see how violently they disagree in the book of Acts, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and yet they come together against Christ and also uh, and also Pontius Pilate, and also Judas. We have these all these different factors that could have coalesced together, and it's because they're being it's being orchestrated by an evil will. And so right. I, I think that that's that's what I think is um, helps us. Well, on the one hand, we we avoid uh, harmful or or erroneous conspiracy theories, where we're we're kind of sort of putting all the blame on one group of people, and right. the, you know some of these people are involved. Yes. But uh, the answer is not to ultimately scapegoat these people or that people or whatever, but to fight directly against the fallen angels and there and liberate right. these, these poor souls from being puppets to the, to the demons. So liberating them. And that's, that's the work of the church ultimately. And so <clears throat> when we have this type of a spiritual understanding, we can really fight for Christendom in souls and society. So we don't get trapped in a, in a, uh, sort of a very nationalistic uh, frame of reference, whether that's World War II things or America or Whig history or all sorts of versions of that. Um, but we also don't avoid, we don't sort of uh, naively think that we can just sort of conciliate with, with, the, with the world, the flesh, and the devil. Uh, no, we have to have be waging eternal war against that. Right. And yeah, it's a good thing to reflect on even in our own spiritual lives is like how much is are we often trying to do like anything but conversion? You know, mm -hmm. like I feel like the that's so much of the domination of psychology in our world, you know, and like therapy and not to bash that it, where it really is accurate or useful for some people. But but um, it's just like anything but actual conversion, <laughs> you know, <laughs> anything but actually like becoming dependent on Christ. And we do that in so many ways, so many crutches that we use in our lives or, you know, so many, um, so many debates, so many debates that we have or a worldly ways of thinking that we have in the church. Like it's like anything but actually, you know, the supernatural, <laughs> anything but relying on grace. 
Yeah, it, it's easy to blame um, people uh, for various things. You know, it's easy to blame the government, easy to blame church leaders who have failed us or whatever. But it's harder to have a spiritual perspective and then think, what do I need to do to change myself and be converted more fully so that I can be a part of the solution, be the change you want to see in the world. <laughs> right. Um, okay. You already touched on this, um, but what is the, uh, the ideology of Roma? And I wanted to ask specifically of how that factors into the gradual process of schism of, of the Eastern church from Rome in the, you know, the, say the second half of the first millennium and then early in the second uh, or second yeah. millennium. So we have these various gods and goddesses in the ancient world, which I argue in my book, just sort of recrop, they just get reincarnated later. <clears throat> and uh, Roma is the goddess of Rome, the eternal personification of eternal Rome. And this is the main ideology that St. Augustine refutes in the City of God Against the Pagans, part one, the first part all about paganism. And it's the idea that this nation is eternal, and this nation shall not pass from off the earth. Um, and it's incarnated in particular with Roma. And what it is, is a, it's a um, demonic deception of the true kingdom, which is the kingdom of heaven, which is truly internal of his kingdom, which shall, there shall be no end. Um, but it is an exaltation of the earthly city against the heavenly by claiming for the earthly city. It's, it's the tower of Babel. Uh, let us, let us make a name for ourselves. They say, um, so it's exalting one's own name to be eternal without God. It's man creating himself to become God without God. So how does this play into uh, the history of the first millennium and whatnot? Well, I already mentioned the Pontifex Maximus ideology. <clears throat> this ideology is, um, what happens is, it's somewhat, it's, we might say it's kind of easy for the Western Christians to be divorced of this Roma ideology because Rome fell. Because Rome fell, it's harder for them to claim that, you know, this is this glorious eternal city because it just got destroyed by the barbarians. Whereas in Constantinople, with all of its magnificent uh, technology of the time, uh, you had the Greek fire, you had the various walls of Theodosius, um, where people were fleeing to Constantinople for refuge. Whereas Rome, the city of Rome in Italy was this backwater, you know, overthrown by the barbarians. Constantinople is this great city. So it, it's easy for this idea of Roma to continue in Constantinople, where there's this eternal city and there's sort of this melding of the fortunes of the church with the fortunes of the Roman Empire. One of the important things to remember is that the term Byzantine Empire is, is, is a later term that 1400 uh, people in 14 1500s decided to impose on the east the mm -hmm. eastern roman empire always called themselves romans right uh, and there was a roman emperor on the throne all the way till the fall of constantinople in 1453. um but because of this there is not this divorcing of the roma ideology of eternal rome eternal earthly city with the heavenly city of the christendom there's really not any book like city of God in the East written in Greek doesn't exist. And so there, there is this sort of tendency of the Roman emperor in Constantinople to acclaim himself um, as this, uh, this uh, representative of Roma, eternal Rome, and to act like he is the high priest, just as the Roman emperors did before. There's sort of an apotheosis of the emperors who are, um, uh, canonized in, in, in a certain sense, and some of them even are canonized. Um, and this is what creates this big tension, or this is one huge factor of the tension between East and West, because in the West, there was no emperor for a very long time until they restored the Roman emperor uh, in the year 800. Um, and so you just had the church power of the Pope. 
who claimed for himself certain prerogatives that the emperor stated was only given to him. Um, and this is what this is why the Greeks, when when the when the Roman Catholics, when the Western Latins begin to baptize these various barbarian nations and incorporate them into Christendom. This is what offends the Greeks so much, because if they're if they're in this Roma mentality, for them, conversion was part and parcel with expanding the Roman Empire. So the Emperor Justinian reconquers the Western Empire, and that's part of the conversion process for him. So like converting is not just baptism, but it's also you have to become a Roman citizen. And that's part of Roma as well. So we have this vision informed by city of God against the pagans by St. Augustine in the West, but we have this old pagan idea of Roma, which continues to be chastened by this Pope in the West who claims to be uh, the, the successor of St. Peter. Um, and this is what is sort of the underlying the, the reading behind between the lines of these different councils would say, Oh, well, Old Rome can still have prerogatives, but it's only because it's the imperial city. But if, if ecclesiastical prerogatives are based on the imperial prerogatives, that's Roma right there. It's that church that Christ founded the church uh, in terms of the Roman Empire. Christ used the Roman Empire, but the Roman Empire was subordinated to the authority of the apostles. And so the whole such such a big portion of this is. Um, this Roman Roma ideology, and it and it becomes reincarnated in various places, which also have the most anti-Catholic biases. Like Moscow is the third Rome. That yeah, kind of Moscow thing. is the main other one, the third Rome. But it also there's a there's a Bulgarian Roma. There's a Siberian, are the um, so uh, Siberian, not Siberian, um, Bulgakov. I forgot. I'm forgetting the the Slavic nation. But there, there's other manifestations of it whereas other other powers that didn't really have that um yeah do not have the same um thing but as i say in the very beginning it's it's the building of the the triumph arch is this tower of babel manifestation um because this same ideology gets reincarnated once again in the anglican regime in whig history it's the sort of the same sort of roma ideology and right. then we have manifest destiny. It's the same sort of uh, ideology of this eternal empire, this eternal nation that will go on forever and never die. Right. Um, but that can yeah, only like be Lincoln. stated. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's interesting. I mean, um, it it does seem like not that this has never happened in the Catholic Church at different periods to some extent, but it does seem like the Eastern Orthodox churches, um, in part because of their re regionalism as well, are 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 particularly susceptible to really getting identified with the state. I mean, obviously, we see that in the case of the Russian Orthodox Church, you know, certainly in the past century, and definitely today as well. But, um, you know, uh, even the fact that like in the Orthodox Church, Constantine is a saint and called has the title equal to the apostles, I was never comfortable with that. Yes, Constantine was a great providential figure. Uh, many great qualities. He was baptized on his, you know, at the end of his life. So it's probably in heaven, but, um, uh, you know, he also, you know, murdered a lot of his family members. And this is after, you know, uh, legalizing Christianity and all, all of the great stuff that he did. And so to, to sort of, and they do this with some of the other, you know, Eastern emperors as well, if I, if I remember correctly. So, um, yeah, there's just some things that are like, wait, I don't know. That seems like an over identification of the church with, you know, with the state there. And because this guy did good things for the church, that means he was a saint. Right. Um, yes. Constantine, Justinian, Theodora, his wife is also, uh, uh, put in mosaics at, with um, halos. Um, I was thinking of Serbia. Serbia was the was the nation I was was of the other Roman uh, ideology. But um, there's what's interesting is that it's. I mean, most of the Roman empires emperors in the East are not canonized, and yet they are still venerated like a Pontifex Maximus. And there's still actually rituals. There's old rituals of the Pontifex Maximus that were holdovers from these pagan rituals, um, which are which are still being performed in, into the 900s by Roman emperors. 
Um, so there, there is this tension, whereas the, the Western Roman emperor and the other kingdoms are, they're also taking some of their pagan past of their monarchy, but they're also very much um, modeling this after Old Testament monarchy. Whereas the, the prophet Samuel anoints the king, so the church anoints the king or the emperor and right. sanctions his rule. So the, the, the pope or the bishop is, is ultimately higher than the king, right. whereas in Constantinople, um, Justinian's bishops were very much his own bureaucrats. The, the bishop of Constantinople was uh, you know, taken out and put back in and moved around at will. Um, as this government bureaucrat. <clears throat> and to a degree, there is also, there needs to be a tension between the temporal power. The temporal power does have some say in bishops and that sort of thing as well. But it is this more mutual, mutual submission, if you will, <laughs> if we go back to mutual <laughs> submission, as a mutual submission there. So, uh, but it, it was, it, when I was started to look at some of these cultural aspects about the east west schism i was really blown away looking at some of these things and and how much it really seemed to illuminate really what was going on and i never even realized this until i started to look at it from taking like a, a pagan roman greco-roman civilization view of these different things looking at the the pre you know constantine emperor constantine right he creates a triumph arch like many of his predecessors did um just Emperor Justinian, his church, Hagia Sophia, becomes his own triumph arch, uh, its architectural thing, which was actually also a reaction to uh, it was a political event as well for him because he, he was re reacting to the Nika riots and, and his massacring of these civilians and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So it's this really interesting interplay, uh, which helps to inform this East West tension, which continues to boil. Um, do you have time for one more question? Yeah, sure. Um, I wanted to ask you about one more thing that re really recurs in the book in an interesting way, and that is the theme of the lust for money as something that is a constant thorn in the side of Christian civilization. And I don't even have anything more specific than that, but I just wanted to ask you to talk a little bit about, yeah, the, that that theme, why it's um, it seems like it's something I don't hear too much about these days. Um, and, and as part of Christian yeah. history, so um, it seems also to be to be a neglected theme, maybe because in our at least in our American context, you know. Oh yeah, definitely. I, and that I mean, this is what's again just coming right from the scripture and how the Old Testament is very much fighting against idolatry of gods, which is sort of the conspicuous idolatry. But the New Testament brings out another level of idolatry, namely the love of money. And what's so hmm. interesting is it's this subtle uh, form of idolatry, which is um, really it's what is money? Money is power. Money gives you power. It's it's saying I now possess power by having money. Yeah. And so what's so interesting is that the church in her in, in the way that the church deals with things like slavery, for example, slave trade, uh, the church deals with economics of the ancient Roman empire, usury, all sorts of things is that there's this basic assumption that there is this pernicious idolatry called the love of money and it must be destroyed. And it must be, we must be assumed that money just corrupts money corrupts you. And you see this in the book of revelation again, uh, where Babylon falls, who trafficked in all these things. And he also trafficked in human souls, i.e. slavery. And um, what's so interesting is how the, the church really cuts to the heart of that in all societies that she comes in contact with is that she, by, by teaching this universal kingdom of heaven and the beatitudes and, and the spirituality and empowered by divine grace, um, societies are able to overcome this love of money, at least in the sense that they're become, they're, they're, the culture gains a cultural momentum against the love of money um, so that people are ashamed to hoard their wealth. That's, that's a shame. Like individuals might do it, but that's shameful. 
Um, you have noblesse oblige. The noblemen are, they have money. The reason they have money is so that they can uh, have, um, throw a party for the whole village and put on the dances and protect the village. And um, so we have this um, pernicious thing of uh, the this pernicious love of money. And it begins to really corrupt uh, Christendom when various Catholic powers succumb to the temptation to join in with the Muslim trans-Saharan slave trade. This is another thousand-year history, which is completely left out of the history books, and that there was this racial ideology that was promoted by the Muslims in trans-Saharan Africa, where it was, this is, this is sort of this, the slave trade itself is sort of this ultimate manifestation of the love of money because it's support subordinating um, this lust for money, <clears throat> destroying families for the sake of this, this power, this money that comes from the slave trade. And then we have uh, the economic aspect of the reformation, which again is almost totally ignored. Um, in the fact that the the Protestant ideology, Protestant theology, these heresies allowed princes to seize money and take money from the poor. They were able to take monasteries, take lands, steal from other people and get power and money and wealth, which the Protestant theology then justified. And then we have these ideologies of modern economics. Uh, and in, in the book, I, d I make distinctions between what we would call free market economics, things like benefits of that, good things and that. But then we have this providential capitalism, which is where after we've stolen all this, these lands and goods, after we've done these things, we've committed theft, we've succumbed to our lust for money. Now we're going to create a, a whole ideology which justifies and rationalizes what we just did. This is all for the better, guys, actually. Just come on, get get with the program. Uh, because this is all just part of this providential web of economic transactions where we all just sort of approve each other. Um, but <clears throat> Christopher Dawson says that this is what transferred the love of money from the root of all evil to the mainstream of social good. And uh, it's like, wow, like... How that's that seems uh that seems like quite a transformation um yeah quite a discovery that you could take this pernicious form of idolatry and make that into a good thing um so i i think that that today there is this remarkable idolatry of mammon remarkable idolatry of money today um which is just minimized as as a threat and so um, I think that the, it's, it's just quite remarkable how much the love of money has caused these different historical shifts in the ways that uh, things have been going so well and then the love of money destroys it. Or they were going so well over here and the love of money then destroys it. it, it this is, it's, it's a pernicious theme, but I think that's the reason why we're given this revelation in Scripture to give us this warning and show us uh, this, um, the, the true path to the kingdom of heaven. Well, Tim, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I really enjoyed talking to you and I enjoyed reading the book as well. Thanks, Thomas. I really appreciate your time and I look forward to talking again soon. Yes. So again, people, the, the book is City of God versus City of Man, The Battles of the Church from Antiquity to the Present by Timothy S. Flanders. And I will link to where you can buy that in the show notes. Um, so yeah, again, Tim will be returning to the show before uh, too long to talk about uh, Carol Wojtyla, aka future John Paul II, uh, his his philosophical magnum opus, Person and Act, and that should be fun. Um, let me also remind everybody, the Catholic Culture Podcast like catholicculture.org and all of our other podcasts is entirely user funded. So if you'd like to help us continue uh, producing all of our podcasts and everything you see on our YouTube channel, all the commentary and liturgical year information on our website, uh, etc., please do uh, consider donating. 
And you can do that at catholicculture.org slash donate slash audio. We pray for our benefactors daily. And if you can't donate, please pray for us. All right, everybody, thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you next time. The Catholic Culture Podcast is a production of catholicculture.org. Check out our other podcasts, including Way of the Fathers, an early church history podcast hosted by Mike Aquilina, Catholic Culture Audiobooks, bringing to life classic Catholic writings, and Criteria, the Catholic Film Podcast, featuring deep analysis of great films from a Catholic perspective. You'll find all of this, as well as Catholic news, commentary, liturgical year resources, and much more at catholicculture.org.